Welcome back to Trading 360. It's time for the 360 round. Taking a look at oil, which has been hovering around uh, last week's lows. Uh, where is the demand and will it surge? What stocks to watch? Stuart Glickman's with us, Deputy Research Director and Energy Equity Analyst at CFRA Research, and Tamara Esner, Principal Vectus Energy Partners. Thank you so much for being with you. Um, Tamara, you really give us a global look. You talked about Russia and China. Um, where do you feel oil should be? It's currently around 77. What's the landscape? Hi, Nicole. Great to see you again. Um, yeah, we expect oil to sort of trade sideways in the first half of the year. It's seasonally a weak time for oil anyway from a demand perspective. Um, and we've got a couple of things going on, slowing demand growth in China, still robust, but slowing down. At the same time, non-OPEC supply growth is you know, more than enough to meet the global demand growth. Um, so that's going on, on on the one side. At the same time, obviously, we've got these OPEC production cuts um, and this geopolitical situation. So we think that um, the, the bar is very high from a geopolitical perspective to see a material uh, and sustained impact on oil prices. So even while um, the situation in the Middle East and, and Russia, Ukraine remains very tense and, and uncertain. We think it's not really going to have much of an impact on prices. So to your question, um, barring any you know real impact, um, direct hit on, on oil assets, we expect sort of this like range bound trading in the first half of the year and then more catalysts in, in the back half of the year in terms of the seasonally higher uptick in, in demand, as well as um, maybe a, a, a slowdown in interest rate hikes as, as we go forward towards the, the November elections. Yeah, I was just saying, uh, you know, reading one of the analyst notes about uh, that maybe the price of oil is ignoring the near strike by the Houthi rebels um, on an oil tanker in the Red Sea, the air strikes by the U.S., Britain also being within the region. Um, there's a lot going on over there, but at the same time, we're steady Eddie over here. S Stuart Glickman, where do you think we're headed and why? Yeah, hi, Nicole. So I'm with Tamar on this one. I think somewhere in the range of 75 to 80 makes a lot of sense near term. Uh, to your point, um, geopolitical um, battles in Russia, in, um, in the Middle East are being really kind of shrugged off at this point. Uh, I think the key to watch is Iran. I think that if the, the battling spreads to Lebanon, which is a proxy uh, for Iran, or directly to a, a battle between Iran and Israel, I, I think that would send oil prices higher uh, with, a, with a kind of a newfound geopolitical risk. Um, but absent that, um, I think folks are, are a little disappointed with some of what should be better demand drivers and yet aren't presenting themselves. So Asia Pacific demand has been kind of lackluster. Um, right. People are waiting for rate cuts to help stimulate some demand. Th those haven't arrived yet. So I think if you're an oil bull, you have to be prepared to wait a little bit. 2024 is probably going to be pretty choppy. And, and these names that you gave us to keep an eye on, TRGP, uh, which is Target Resources. You had um, also EDP, the Portugal name, Energy Transfer, ET. What is it about those names? Are those possible winners in your eyes, Stuart? Right. So, so Targa, uh, it's actually EPD, Enterprise Products Partners. Uh, and energy transfer ET, all of them play in the midstream sandbox. Uh, they depend much more on volumes than they do on oil prices per se. So even if oil prices kind of go sideways to tomorrow's point, um, as long as you have the volumes flowing, uh, the midstream firms are going to prosper. And we think that volumes are gonna remain relatively high. Uh, the marginal well is increasingly gassier. Um, there's a lot of, um, uh, even 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 in the oil plays, you're still getting natural gas and natural gas liquids along with them. Those have to be splintered off and sent in in different directions, and that's where some of these midstream firms come to play. So we like midstream at the moment on the basis that oil prices themselves and certainly gas prices are not going to have a ton of upside this year. Right. Okay. Understood. So likes midstream. I got those three names. Tomorrow, you you talked about. Um, U.S. production growth to slow, um, productivity increasing. Tell me a little bit about names like Exxon and Chevron. Um, they've certainly been trying to adjust to the new age of energy, some alternative energy. Are these names still leaders, winners in your eyes? 
Sure. So first of all, we, we don't do stock specific um, advice, but overall we find the Are sector the is more, yeah, just overall. more, yeah, we think the sector is overall more attractive because of consolidation. Um, I, I agree. I mean, midstream is definitely a beneficiary of higher um, production volumes. I think as a result of the dislocation in the Red Sea, uh, U.S. Gulf Coast refiners are, are real beneficiaries of that. I mean, we talked about lack of geopolitical risk premium in oil prices, but you're seeing much more uh, dislocation and, and refined product price spreads. And so refiners can, can benefit from that. Um, overall, I think that more consolidation is to be expected, but we don't see M&A as an investable theme. So in the past, we'd see, you know, event driven hedge funds would flock towards EMPs that they thought would be good buyout candidates um, because they thought that they'd get a high uh, takeover premium. We don't see large uh, premiums, but at the same time, we do think that there will be more consolidation. And overall, that makes these companies better. They'll, they'll have more um, cash returns to investors that will be more resilient to ups and downs in commodity cycles. Um, but at the same time, the, the real question from a macro commodity perspective is what does this consolidation mean for overall U.S. production yeah. growth. And we, we think it's quite strong um, and maybe slow down in the latter half of the year because there's a lot of companies that want to keep production higher so that they can get takeover right. um, per, uh, offers. Yeah, and look, I mean, you make a great point about the M&A activity. We had so many names and consolidation. Storchi, are you watching any of the smaller names as possible mergers, acquisitions, takeover targets? Final thoughts quickly. Yeah. So I look, I think anything in the Permian Basin is probably a takeover target. Uh, that seems to be the, the nexus for M&A interest. Um, it's where the well economics are the strongest. Um, I think that the bigger players um, have certainly a, a preference for being uh, production disciplined and not throwing every dollar they have into the oil field. They're spending an awful lot of their, their cash flow on dividends and buybacks. I don't think that's going to change. Some of the smaller companies that want to present as growthier, sure, I think they could probably expand production. And some of the private, uh, the privately held firms that don't have to report to public shareholders, I think, could also drive some more production. I think overall, it's going to be a healthy production environment in the U.S. Um, and probably begins to dissipate a little bit towards the end of this year. Thank you both so much, Stuart Glickman, Tamar Esner. Thank you. Great to see you both.